Zola and Cezanne, the inseparables. In June of this year, 2024, artist and art historian David Henderson and I, literary historian, will be leading a tour to northern France. And one of the places that we will be visiting is a little place called Medon, where Zola purchased a house and his friend Cezanne came to paint. We'd love you to join us on this literary and artistic tour in a truly gorgeous part of the world. So let's have a look at these two fascinating men and inseparable friends for much of their lives. Emile Zola, here painted by another of his artist friends, Manet, lived from 1840 to 1902. His good friend, Cezanne, here in a self-portrait, was born in the year 1839, and he outlived Zola by just a few years, dying in 1906. Now, they met as young teenage boys in the truly beautiful southern town of Aix-en-Provence, and they became extremely close friends very quickly. They both adored poetry. They loved being outside, walking and swimming in the nearby river, and they would recite poetry to each other. They had lots of jokes and what they called debauches of walking in and around the wonderful area of Mont Saint Victoire, a place that Cezanne would end up painting many times over. Isn't that true, David? That is very true indeed, yes. Mont Saint Victoire became a, a kind of a symbol for Cezanne of not only the landscape that he loved so much, his native. Provence, this, this beautiful area around Aix, it also became a, a kind of almost a symbol of Cezanne's epic struggle, heroic quest to develop uh, a new kind of painting. And so many wonderful paintings of that mountain, and to actually see the mountain, of course, is a real thrill. Now, the boys were very opposite in many ways. Cezanne was a big, very direct-spoken boy and was quite physically strong. Emile Zola, whose father was Italian, hence his surname, had a lisp and he was badly bullied when the boys ended up at school together in Aix-en-Provence. And Cezanne defended Zola and stopped the other boys from bullying him. And in gratitude, young Emile Zola the next day brought his friend, Paul Cezanne, a gift of apples. And apples would always be hugely important in their friendship and, of course, in Cezanne's art. He did so many marvellous portrayals of apples, didn't he, David? He did, yes, Cezanne, yes. Cezanne is famous for his still life's and apples feature so prominently in those. And I think there's a tendency to think of Cezanne as, as a kind of a painter of pure form, the kind of precursor to modern art and eventually to abstraction. And Cezanne painted these apples on tabletops, almost in the spirit of a scientist making researchers in, in a kind of a laboratory. And, and, and while this aspect of pure form, almost pure abstraction, is extremely important to understanding Cezanne's art, it's also very easy to forget that they would have had a deep symbolic meaning for Cezanne as well. And I think this connection with Zola and, and this extremely important relationship in his life and what the apple symbolised in the story of that extraordinary relationship, I think should not be forgotten. And I think when, when we look at these marvellous paintings, we should also remember that this long, long friendship with Zola is, is sort of almost lurking somewhere in the background. You can see in these apple paintings that he's not glossing over the reality of the fruit. Some of them look a bit fly-speckled and a bit uh, bruised in different places. They're not perfect apples. And I think what Cezanne was doing in his art was what Zola would go on to do in his strongly realist novels. Now, this is the school, the Collège Bourbon in Aix-en-Provence, that both the boys attended for a while. And interestingly, it was young Emile Zola who won the school's art prize. It's absolutely ironic when you think he won the prize for art and his contemporary and fellow contestant was Paul Cézanne. But interestingly, when the boys were young, Zola wanted to be an artist and Cézanne wanted to be a writer. They adored the works of Victor Hugo and knew many of his plays off by heart. They would recite them to each other. But gradually, as time went on, the boys sorted out where their real talents lay and, of course, went in the directions that would make them famous. 
Now, in 1858, Zola and his mother moved to Paris, but they did have some visits back to Aix-en-Provence, so the boys were able to continue their wonderful walks. And over the years, Cézanne, who didn't like the capital city, would occasionally come and visit Zola in Paris. So they were able to keep up their friendship, which remained hugely important to both of them. Now, Zola got on with writing his wonderful books and before long, making his fame. A book called Therese Racan came out in 1867 and rather shocked people. It's the story of a woman and her lover who murder the woman's husband. But his real breakthrough came in the year 1877 with La Sommoire, or The Drunkard, showing alcohol problems in the city of Paris. And that book was an absolute bestseller. Nana was about a woman who becomes a prostitute. It came out in the year 1880. His novel, The Earth, 1887. And what I think is his greatest novel, Germinal, an incredibly powerful book about miners in northern France. And that was published in 1885. And I think during these years, Zola got on with working on what is known as his Rougeon Macar series of novels, where he's got lots of characters who keep turning up and other books within the series. And he's trying to show farmers and miners and various types of workers in a very, very realistic way. And I think what Zola was doing with this sort of series of novels is really what Cezanne does too, with his series of paintings of Mont Saint Victoire, the series of apples, the series of pine trees, and the other landscapes that he so loved to paint. However, unfortunately, in the year 1886, Zola published a novel called L'Oeuvre, translated as The Masterpiece. And this almost definitely is based on the life of Cezanne, and it depicts a failed painter. Now, of course, Cezanne during these years was selling very, very little indeed. People were not interested in his paintings. And when Cezanne read this novel, Zola sent him a copy. He was absolutely appalled by what he read. And the friendship came to a very abrupt and very tragic end after so many years of the two of them inspiring each other, enjoying their walks and so much more. So it was very sad that one book by Zola would bring the productive friendship to an end. But before that happened, Zola purchased a house in a little village called Medon, not too far from Paris. He wanted a bit of privacy because he'd become so famous as a result of his novels, and he loved the country life. So he bought this house, and there he would invite his various literary friends to come and visit him a young man called Guy de Maupassant, not yet known as a great writer of short stories, was one of those visitors. And one day Zola and some of his other friends came up with the idea that they would collaboratively produce a volume of short stories. And it became called Les Soirées de Médon, or The Evenings at Médon. And as you can see from the title page there, various authors, including Maupassant, contributed short stories. And Guy de Maupassant contributed a brilliant short story called Ball of Fat, Bull the Sweef. And when Zola read it, he realized that he had virtually been outclassed by this young man that up until that time he had not really taken very seriously. So that volume of short stories would be the start of Guy de Maupassant's amazing career as a writer of some of the world's greatest short stories. So very important indeed. Now, Cézanne very frequently ended up visiting uh, Zola at the house at Medon. And of course, he would bring with him his paints and his easel and paint brushes, and he would start to paint while he was there. There's one delightful story that he was sitting one day by the river and he was working on a painting, and a passerby stopped and had a look at him and said, oh, you're trying your hand at painting, are you? And he came and looked a little bit closer at what was there on the easel. And he shook his head and he said, well, don't give up your day job. So it's a rather wonderful story of uh, one of the world's greatest painters being told to give it all up because he really didn't show very much talent. 
So I'm going to pass over to David to talk a little bit about these wonderful paintings that Cezanne did when he was visiting Maidan in the 1880s. So this painting we have actually seen together, David. It hangs in the great uh, Burrell collection in Glasgow in Scotland, and I think it's a magnificent painting. But why is it so fabulous? Well, it is a magnificent painting, yes, in the wonderful Burrell collection in Glasgow. It's considered to be quite a pivotal painting in Cezanne's oeuvre, in his, in his body of work. And it's actually, Gauguin actually once owned this painting, it said. he Only for a little while, he had to sell it soon after because he, he needed the money. But Gauguin, also, we know, a great painter, clearly admired Cezanne and, and admired in particular uh, this kind of painting. We can see echoes of what Gauguin did, uh, in, in particularly in the technique of this painting. But the relationship between Zola and, and Cezanne was, was obviously one of, of a, an extended and close friendship since boyhood, um, but it also had a sort of a professional dimension because Zola was, of course, one of the great champions of the Impressionists, and he wrote extensively about the Impressionists and their this new style of painting. And on the eve of Cezanne's visit to Maidan in 1880, he'd asked uh, Zola to intervene on behalf of the Impressionists. He was had something of a high profile and he had requested at, at the behest of his friends Monet and Renoir that Zola intervene with the government in the annual Salon, the great uh, exhibition of paintings that was held every year in Paris and, and exclusion from which of course, meant that, that your career couldn't advance. And Zola said, look, I'll give it a go. There's not much I can do, I'm afraid, but I will write an extended article about your painting. And he wrote this article, which clearly gives signs that at this point in time, Zola was sort of cooling off, basically said in this long article that it was full of promise, but it hadn't yet reached fruition. It seemed like to him a series of experiments and new techniques which simply hadn't reached their fulfilment. And a lot of commentators have seen this painting which Cezanne did on an island uh, which is in the, the middle of the Seine looking back towards Maidan as a kind of response to this. Uh, Zola said the, the Impressionist painters seem to be almost preparing the way for a painter of, of great genius who is yet to come. And so it's almost as though Cezanne is here saying, well, couldn't that great genius be me? And he here for the first time, or one of the first paintings where he really starts to look not so much at the light and the color and the sparkling and evanescent character of the landscape, but something of the sort of the deeper structure of it. And you can see that he's chosen his subject extremely well. He's using the, the, the kind of the horizontals and the verticals of, of what's in front of him. So that, that horizontal line of the riverbank and those very distinct and sharp verticals of the trees. And he's creating a sort of a series of little windows almost through the trees to the buildings beyond. And he's starting to do here what he becomes famous for, that idea of emphasizing the form and here he's doing with light and shadow and concentration of color. At the same time, he emphasizes that, that sort of geometric or sculptural form of objects, he's compressing the space. And so he's creating a new way of thinking about painting form and space here for the first time. And he's emphasizing that form with those, you can see that the very strong diagonal brush strokes that he's using, particularly on that area of the riverbank in the lower part of the painting, almost as though he's trying to sort of literally construct it from first, first principles. And so Zola was right in a way that Impressionism hadn't reached its fulfillment. And I think a lot of the painters associated that felt that sense that they were simply painting the, the beautiful, evanescent, ephemeral surface of things, these effects of light and, and their shifting and changing character. And each of the Impressionists responded to this, what's often called a crisis in their own way. Uh, Renoir, for instance, started painting these rather monumental bathers. So going back to sort of drawing and classical form. Monet said, well, I, I still want to keep painting this shifting and changing surface of things, but I'll paint the same subject over and again. And on our tour, we'll be visiting, of course, uh, the town of Rouen and seeing that the famous cathedral that Monet painted in so many different lights. Uh, Monet, of course, also painted haystacks. So, so he's really saying, it, do it doesn't matter if I'm painting 
a, you know, a masterpiece of Gothic architecture or a simple haystack, what really interests me is the quality of light and how it changes. And Cezanne took this impressionist technique, this, this famous technique, which, we can, which is so evident in all the impressionist paintings of short brush strokes of paint applied side by side in a very uh, distinct and discreet way to give, give a sense of this sort of sparkling character of light. And Cezanne takes this technique and he uses it not so much to show light, but to show the kind of the internal construction of things. And this is what Cezanne becomes famous for. So this view back to Maidan is a sort of, uh, I suppose it can be seen as sort of a, a response to his friend's uh, sort of criticism of the, of the Impressionist movement. And I think it's interesting in this painting, we don't actually see uh, Zola's house. I think it's just to the right off shot. I don't know if there's any sort of comment that uh, Cezanne is, is trying to make uh, in, the, in that Leaving particular... him out. <laughs> Yes, it's editing it out. Yeah. So here's another one of the uh, the village done by Cezanne in 1885. Yes, and here we can see with these unfinished paintings of Cezanne something of his his technique. This I think shows very clearly this sense of almost the geometric structure of the houses in particular, and the way that he's concentrated uh, so carefully on that arrangement of, of geometric shapes the geometric form. And it's easy to see the influence that Cezanne would have later on, a, a year or two after his death, on the Cubist movement. And so there are kind of two Cezannes in a way. There's the historical Cezanne, the struggling artist, the, the lonely genius who, who goes back to Aix-en-Provence. And there's the posthumous Cezanne, the Cezanne who becomes like a prophet of a new uh, modern art. Uh, this is a drawing it's uh, and watercolour. And again, we can see the concentration on what we might call the negative spaces or the negative shapes. So if you go to your local evening classes to do some art and, and you're painting your still life or your landscape, the teacher is probably going to come up to you, the tutor is going to come up to you and say, you should concentrate more on your negative spaces. And that simply means that the spaces around things, the spaces between things. And you can see how Cezanne is making as much of a feature of the, let's say, the spaces between those two tree trunks in the centre of the composition as he is uh, concentrating on the form of the tree trunks themselves. And it's this total integration of all of the shapes uh, and, and all the forms and all of the spaces in the pictures into one coherent graded whole that makes uh, Cezanne such a, such a revolutionary painter, I think. The, the river than the village, but another yes, very yeah. beautiful one. Very beautiful, yes. It's a, a good, good example, again, of how closely uh, attached Cezanne was to the Impressionist movement, uh, this, this con concentration on, on light and atmosphere. And the fleeting character of things, that sort of never-to-be-repeated instant, which was very much part of this whole project, started really by the poet Baudelaire, and he wrote a famous essay, The Painter of Modern Life. Uh, and, and he said things like, you know, he, he thought that painters should show modern people how heroic they are in, in their black frock coats. So he wanted painters to, to look not at mythology and history, the Bible, the traditional subjects, but rather modern life for their content. And it was very much in the, uh, the changing, the fleeting, the contingent nature of modern life in big cities that the Impressionists were trying to capture, even if they were painting sort of rural landscapes, it was something of this sort of never repeated instant, that, that particular hour of the day, that particular season, which is passing even as we look at it. And so again, as I said before, Cezanne is, is sort of moving away from this, this idea of the fleeting and the changing uh, and trying to create, as he memorably said, um, something more permanent and more stable, something like the art of the museums. So again, he's looking at this internal structure of things to, as again, he said famously, to redo Poussin again from nature, to, re to make something that had the structure and solidity of the great classical 17th century French painter Poussin, uh, not by painting mythological figures, but rather by painting uh, the landscape that he saw in front of him. And one last little sketch that he did. Well, all drawings, I think, are, are interesting drawings by great artists because they really give us an insight in the way that paintings never can really show us uh, something of an insight in, into the sort of the thought processes going on 
behind what's going on creatively and imaginatively in the arts. You can really see the artist's mind work in a drawing like this uh, in a way that you can't quite see in the painting. So again, it's, it's looking at the shapes in between things, that, that, that sort of abstract geometry of houses, of roofs, of windows, and the way they interact. This idea that the, the background space almost coming forward to uh, a, a painted reality, which is as, as a sort of a parallel to nature. And it's interesting to think of how uh, Zola's ideas must have been very much in the mind of Cezanne as he created this new and revolutionary style in painting. Zola famously said, he gave a, a, a definition of art, didn't he? It, it's a, a corner of creation seen through a temperament. And this idea that we interact with reality, with nature, with things as they really are, but it's always filtered through our own sort of individual personalities, our own individual imaginations. And, and Cezanne famously had this very sort of fiery, intense temperament. And, and we can see something of this sort of very sort of concentrated and intense emotion being kind of worked out. As he, as he focuses on the shapes of, of the natural world that he, sees, that he sees in front of him. So I think it's, it's, it's sometimes we can concentrate so much on Cezanne, the sort of the, the abstract painter, the painter of pure form, uh, that it's, it's, it's easy to forget that he is responding in, in a very instinctive and visceral way to nature. Uh, Cezanne used to speak of his petit sensations, his little sensations, the things that these emotions that he felt in front of the landscape. Well, it's all making me very excited about visiting Maidon, the fabulous house of Zola, and seeing the actual landscapes where Cezanne did these wonderful works. Now, tragically, Emile Zola died almost certainly as a result of murder. That is still being discussed by biographers today, but his involvement in the famous Dreyfus case, he was a great supporter of Dreyfus, had made him very unpopular with certain members of society, and almost certainly he was poisoned by having a, a flu into the room blocked up by a workman. And although his friendship with Cezanne had officially come to an end, the two men had ceased to see each other and to correspond, it's been said that when Cezanne heard the news of his friend Zola's death, he went into his room and he howled almost like a dog in his terrible grief at the loss of Emile Zola. So a fascinating friendship between the two men, both incredibly great in the artistic fields that they finally got themselves sorted out in. And of course, they have left us a truly wonderful legacy. The Tour to France in June will take everybody to Normandy, to Brittany, to wonderful cities like Rouen and Amiens. Uh, we actually do head down almost towards the centre of France. We visit amazing art museums where David will talk to us about the paintings and the statues that I'm really looking forward to. And we visit places connected with wonderful writers, their homes, graveyards where they're buried, we eat in restaurants that they loved, and we have an amazing artistic and literary pilgrimage through northern France. David and I would love you to join us on this very special tour in June 2024.